Welcome back to another episode of Palisade Radio. This is your host, Colin Cattell. Today, joining us on the program is a new guest. His name is Per Wimmer, and he manages Wimmer Financial and the Wimmer Family Office. Per, welcome to the program. Thank you. Before we get started, you uh, are actually involved in quite a few interesting things, some extreme sports. I saw something online about you uh, skydiving over Mount Everest and then uh, talking about doing trips to space. Yeah, that's correct. Apart from my interest in uh, in finance and uh, in investing in natural resources, uh, I'm, I'm also an adventurer and a future uh, astronaut. So it is true that in 2008, I, I uh, conducted the first um, skydive about Mount Everest, um, tandem skydive with uh, with my partner in uh, Ralph Mitchell, an English guy. Uh, so, so we we uh, successfully completed that. That's never been done before uh, up until that point. Uh, we initially looked into climbing Everest, uh, decided against it because we thought it was going to be too dangerous, and then decided to take Everest sort of uh, top down, if you like, instead. And uh, and yeah, yeah, it was sort of a, uh, a culmination of a number of adventure activities. I've, before that, I've travelled throughout the world. I've been to 72 countries on Earth. Um, I've lived with the Indians in the Amazon. I've been skiing at 5,500 meters, uh, the tallest, uh, highest ski st- skiing station in the world. And I've traveled um, Africa thin and thick. So I've been um, doing a lot of sort of adventure stuff on, uh, on Earth. Uh, looking forward, uh, my next adventures um, it, it relates to space. Uh, I am signed up for Two missions uh, on two different ro- two different rockets uh, to go into space um, on uh, yeah two two private rockets and uh, can't wait to get up there. So it's going to be the ultimate adventure. Yeah, it seems it seems a little strange at first uh, being in something uh, like the resource space and then into extreme sports. But uh, a lot of people I've noticed that are top in the business. You can take uh, like a Robert Friedland or a Frank Juster. They're in the highest risk businesses out there, the movie production business, boutique hotels and speculating in resources. So it sounds like you've got that knack for adventure as well. Absolutely, I've I've got a, a strong adventure gene. I mean, like I said, I've, I've traveled you know throughout the world and I've done done all these great things and met all these amazing cultures and people. Uh, but obviously, when you're in the natural resource space, I mean, you, you also meet some very interesting characters. I have to say, and I've certainly met that throughout the past ten years where I've, I've had uh, you know Wimmer Financial going. Uh, so so it has been really really interesting. Obviously, seeing the super cycle and the op, the, the the good times and the bad times. And met a number of uh, amazing entrepreneurs in the mining space. Uh, it's been a great, uh, great uh, privilege and, and and really, really interesting. And uh, we keep meeting new people and uh, work with other investors on a daily basis. So, really uh, uh, interesting uh, and exciting. I think would be a characteristic of it. But obviously, from an investment point of view, you got to do your homework, and uh, and and there's no no replacement for that. You really got to roll up the sleeves and look into the the story and the management team. And, and the backgrounds and that sort of thing. So, Perry, you're you're based in London, and um, what's a little bit of background about Wimmer Financial and how you got into the resource space? Where you guys fit in uh, in the resource space? Yeah, I was a generalist before. I mean, my background is uh, I was I used to work at Goldman's around the Scandinavian uh, equities business, and uh, had a couple of other stops at Colin Stewart, which is Canaccord today, and also Man Group, which is a sixty-five billion dollar hedge fund. Um, but uh, so I was a generalist, but at that point I, I started looking at that, looking at uh, good alpha ideas, um, where could we find alpha in the marketplace, and came across the natural resource space. This was sort of pre the super cycle, and thought there's some compelling supply demand dynamics taking place. And on the back of that, I decided that this was really a, a sector that was worth doing a lot more homework in. So I did, and with China consuming more and more of, of raw materials. Uh, I, I discovered that it was it was clearly a, a no-brainer from a supply-demand point of view. So so we decided to get a lot more involved, and this is now 10 years ago, and we've been involved ever, ever since. Um, so I, I really came as a generalist into the sector, but found it compelling. Yes, it's cyclical. Yes, it goes up and down, and, and it's certainly not for the faint-hearted. Um, but it's also an exciting sector and a sector that offers some uh, very high returns from time to time. 
Perry, I see pictures online of you with people like Richard Branson and Elon Musk, probably to do with uh, your interest in space. But thinking of Elon Musk and all of the interest around the EV space and batteries, uh, why don't we start there as asking what kind of um, commodities you're most focused on? Are you focused on those energy metals and what else? Absolutely. We're, we're certainly playing the energy metals battery storage uh, theme at the moment, and that would translate into uh, the likes of cobalt, um, lithium, graphite, uh, copper, nickel. So those those type of metals, the battery metals, uh, certainly are of, of great interest. And uh, in fact, we are doing a, a lithium deal at the moment as we speak. Uh, so, so absolutely. Secondly, uh, we do like uh, precious metals a lot. So gold and silver, and we're heavily involved in that. We do think the quantitative easing that's uh, is taking place around the world and the printing of money uh, is beneficial to gold and silver as, as, a, as a hard asset hedge. And, and, and that's not going to go away anytime soon. So we still find that very compelling. Thirdly, uh, base metals, copper, zinc, uh, nickel, tin, all the base metals, I think, still has a very, have a very compelling uh, future just from an uptick in demand point of view. And, um, and, and yeah, we continue to have great appetite in, in, in that space specifically. Per, looking at gold and silver, which have uh, a bit of the take of the inflation story, they're a hedge against fiat currencies. Does that part of the equation interest you, or are you more so focused on the supply-demand issues coming out of China and worldwide? On gold specifically, we look at both. It is certainly an infla in inflation protection. Uh, it is a, a hedge against uh, when when things turn turn bad. And I think gold uh, certainly has has got a place in in any portfolio. Um, so it, it is an important asset class almost in in its own right. Uh, but obviously, we do look at supply demand. We do look at all of these other normal uh, factors that that has impact on on the gold price. Our view is we think gold is, is going to sort of stay reasonably stable at sort of between 1150 and 1350 in a foreseeable future, say the next 12, 12 months. Um, so another, and one way is obviously to play through the physical, but another way is to play through um, junior mining companies where you can actually get operational leverage as, as these companies go into production or increase their production. Um, so there are many ways to, to, to play it. And um, uh, and it could also be through the ETFs. I mean, we, we do trade ETFs as well. Um, so um, many ways to implement the uh, the same theme. Excellent. And being that you're based in London, you probably have access to comp companies on the AIM, the ASX, and the TSX, whereas a lot of Canadian investors s uh, stay solely on the, the TSX. Um, is that true? And also, where geographically are you focused on uh, projects? Any no-go zones? So we are global. We're truly global. Anywhere from Australia, Asia, South America, North America, Europe, Africa, etc. Uh, currently, uh, we stay a little bit clear of uh, of Russia, uh, Venezuela, um, Southern Sudan, and, and other uh, and Zimbabwe, for that matter. So a little bit of the spicy end of the political spectrum. Um, in general, but slightly less spicy, we, we would consider even spicier part of, of Africa, say, for instance. Um, although there are jurisdictions in Africa specifically that have gone, that, that have put themselves into no-go zones, like, like Tanzania, for instance, they have shot themselves in the foot by making it prohibitively uninteresting for foreign investors to come in, given what they're doing on the political side. And South Africa is certainly heading that way as well. They're not improving their politics at all. So, but other places like Namibia, Botswana, and that sort of things are very interesting. Uh, in South America, Chile, Chile is fantastic, and uh, Peru, and many other countries, uh, and obviously North America, Canada, U.S. Um, we like. Uh, we're recently active in a in a gold deal in Spain, uh, listed on the TSX, a company called Black Dragon Gold, um, where we're we're active on. So, we we're global, truly global, both in terms of listings and and in terms of um, where we uh, where we go. Perry, you manage a significant amount of capital, much of which is deployed in the commodity space, and 
Uh, you've talked a little bit about uh, your outlook for gold over the next 12 months. Uh, and commodities seem to, to run in tandem, uh, cyclically speaking, and we're in a little bit of a lull right now, or at least a breathing, uh, breathing area. Do you foresee uh, in the next 12 to 24 months having a resumption of the bull market in these junior and mid-tier companies? Yeah, I do think the uh, the bottom of the of the mining market, if you like, was was probably 18 months ago, and and we're now sort of in a solid solid trajectory uh, where where things are actually getting better uh, day by day. Um, by way of anecdote, I was I was attending the Denver Gold Show um, a year ago in Colorado Springs, and you 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 didn't really see a lot of interest from the majors i mean they would send a few guys in there this year around there was a, a massive presence of their they're taking very seriously and that sort of feeds down the food chain um so i think we're we're definitely in a in a cyclical optic in in the sector in in particular for the battery metals for the pressures and the base the bulks are a little bit behind uh, the coal and the iron ore and that sort of things there's a little bit of oversupply in that um, but for, for the upper end of it, the base and the precious, uh, I think definitely li- life is looking uh, looking very good and very 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 positive. And also some some of the eggs, uh, phosphate and potash, uh, also has a, has a, a good uh, good outlook uh, because people still need to eat around the world, and there's, you need to get more and more out of your out of your agricultural resources. So yes, I think the uh, junior mining sector has certainly got a, a positive hill to climb here now and, and we're sort of on the way up back up again from from a very uh, ugly and dark bottom uh, 18 months ago. Yeah, let's talk about the agriculture space a bit. In fact, I was introduced to you and able to do this interview uh, by way of Rob and Mike over at GenSource Potash, which is a company that we've been uh, invested in for quite some time. Uh, Pear, what do you see playing out in the, the potash space? What are you looking for? Obviously, you're interested in gen source. So what kind of lit up there for you? Yeah, I, I think what I've specifically liked about the gen source story is uh, the fact it's actually reasonably low capex. Uh, the problem we have in potash as an industry is that it's fairly oligopolistic. Uh, you have few players and they kind of control the marketplace. And in addition to that, the capex typically for these projects uh, is huge. It's, it's usually into the billions. So you have very high capital barriers to entry and you have a world domination by a few players. Having uh, a, an approach like GenSource, where they come in at much lower capex, I mean, potentially up to $200 million, so a lot, lot less, and also with a clever model on how to uh, integrate uh, the whole supply chain and get end users involved, uh, including in the project, I think it's very, very intelligent. And it's a sort of potash type of project that we've been looking for for a while, um, to find something like that that would that would lower the risk and increase the returns and and have sort of a one-stop solution for the full uh, food chain from from start to finish in addition to the fact that that GenSource also has some very clever ideas um, uh, in terms of how they get the phosphate out of the ground with with without taking the salt part up i.e. leaving the salt down in the underground uh, which is environmentally hugely beneficial because a lot of the a lot of the environmental problems around Around phosphate, uh, so around potash is that you get a big salt mountain, and then you you got to deal with that, and make sure that doesn't leak leak too much. But leaving the salt downstairs, which is what GenSource intends to do, it's it's much much better. So GenSource net net is a is a low capex, environmentally friendly, straightforward with with a very entre- entrepreneurial driven management team, um, and and we like all of the above. Pear, I'm not sure where I'm going to be going with this question, but you mentioned with uh, potash the nature of the deposits being big and deep and how it's extracted that uh, it's prohibitively expensive in most cases. And I find it interesting to look at uh, specific commodities. Take cobalt as an example. It's a secondary metal in the production of uh, copper and nickel in particularly dangerous areas of the world. Or you can look at uranium, uh, which is a commodity that uh, doesn't have very much price sensitivity from the end user being uh, uranium uh, reactors. And, um, you know, I I guess it's an interesting element of the commodity space. And uh, I guess a question I can develop from that is, are there any other really peculiar situations in the commodity space right now that have piqued your interest because of 
some some peculiarity in the commodity? Mm, no, I mean we we really look at sort of demand supply and 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 what is the most what are the most compelling. Uh, uh, commodities uh, at the moment. Uh, we tend to play play more mainstream than specialty metals um, like zircon or mineral sands or, or things like that. So, I mean, we 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 will look at it, um, but we tend to be a little bit more precious base bulk type type of guys. Um, so, so no, it, it's really down to the fundamentals. I mean, what is compelling, what works, um, what 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 looks most interesting at any point in time globally. Excellent. Well, Per, thanks for giving us 15 minutes of your time here. And in fact, uh, more than that, uh, as we've had a few discussions leading up to this interview, and um, I really enjoy having I really enjoyed having you on the program, and look forward to getting you back on the program in the future. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector, junior mining sector, are good people and kind people, hit the bit. How violent that term could be, it actually could be quite violent. Uh, it could be a rip your face off uh, uranium rally. And the world is always going to need raw material. It's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth. Totally destabilized. Hey, hey, troll, did you hear what's going on in Yemen?